What is going on, mere mortals? My name is John Solo, and I am so proud to present the fourth official episode of our animated series, Featured Folklore. The show where we find the most messed up fairy tales and myths from around the world and bring them to life like you've never seen before. With the help of our sponsor, Squarespace, and some incredible artists, Doug, Alejo, Sarah, and Sed, whose profiles you can find in the description, we've covered the traumatizing death of Maui, the murderous tricks of Anansi, and the cannibalist roots of Cinderella. But today we're given the spotlight to a criminally underappreciated god in the Greek pantheon. His name is Hephaestus. He's the god of fire, blacksmithing, and creativity, and this is the messed up tale of his fall, revenge, and ascension to the heavens. The story begins during the Silver Age of Man, an age that artisans, poets, and scholars living in ancient Greece all describe as pretty chill. Zeus and his siblings had just defeated their ancestors, the Titans, after a 10-year war for control of the universe, and the mortal beings on Earth were living simple lives of hunting and farming. Compared to the later ages of man, everyone had it pretty good. But on this particular day, the King of Olympus woke up with a headache unlike any he had felt before. At first, he thought it might just be a hangover because there'd been a lot of celebrating since the Titans' defeat, but this one was different. The pounding in his head felt like something was trying to break out, and before long, he was begging for someone, anyone, to try and alleviate his pain. That's when the Titan God of Forethought, Prometheus, volunteered his services. He didn't know much about medicine, but if something was inside Zeus's head, he knew that his trusty axe would allow it to escape. Plus, how often do you get to hit the king of the universe in the head with an axe? He saw his opportunity and he was gonna take it. Well, at this point, Zeus was on the brink of insanity and accepted Prometheus' solution without shopping around for an alternative. The Titan swung his ax as hard as he could, embedding it into Zeus' skull, and the Olympians couldn't believe what happened next. Prometheus delivered what would have been a death blow to the god of thunder and lightning, but since Zeus was immortal, he wasn't killed. Instead, he was reverted to his purely elemental form as a storm cloud, and with a flash of lightning, the source of his headache appeared before them. Standing there, fully formed with spear and all, was Athena, goddess of wisdom and strategic warfare. It turns out that when Zeus had discovered his ex-wife Metis, the titan goddess of wisdom, was pregnant, he swallowed her whole in an attempt to prevent her from giving birth to a son that would usurp his throne. By this time, Metis had been fully absorbed into Zeus's being, but Athena had too much of her father's warrior spirit to let him hold her back from seeing the world. So she fought for her freedom and earned it. Everyone on Olympus was excited for her arrival too. That is, everyone except for Zeus's wife, Hera. The goddess of motherhood knew that Zeus was in a relationship before her, but she didn't realize that Athena was the result of that relationship. Hera thought that he had gone ahead and created Athena entirely on his own, so she resolved to do the same with less than stellar results. When the goddess of childbirth, Ilithia, presented Hera with her newborn son, the queen was disgusted at what she saw. This was the ugliest baby she had ever laid eyes on. He was red and puffy, his face had become misshapen from his constant crying, and worst of all, he wasn't even fully formed. There was a little stump where his right leg should have been. Hera decided that this monster wasn't worthy of growing up on Olympus or of receiving her motherly love, so she disposed of him in the most effective way she knew how, by casting him from the heavens. Whether he drowned or splattered off some rocks didn't matter to her. The fall from Olympus was far enough to kill even the strongest gods, let alone a baby. So when she saw him disappear through the clouds below, he also disappeared from her mind. After that failed attempt at getting even with her husband, Hera figured she would bide her time before trying again. As far as Zeus knew, she was happy about the new addition to her family, so there was no reason to rock the boat with him at this point. Meanwhile, that new addition proved time and time again to be worthy of her spot on Olympus. She had protected the Grecian cities from barbarians and monsters that terrorized the countryside. She gave humans a new source of oil, food, and wood by creating the first ever olive tree. And she even stood by her father when Olympus was attacked by Typhon, the Mac Daddy of all monsters. Now, Hera would never admit that she was wrong about Athena, but she was willing to give her another chance. And while on her way to pay the goddess of warfare a visit, Hera made an amazing discovery. 
Sitting there in the courtyard were ornate golden thrones for each of the goddesses. Aphrodite had one, Athena had one, and so did Hera. But Hera's was the most extravagant of them all. None of the goddesses knew how the thrones got there, but they assumed that Zeus had sent Hermes to drop them off. He had been away on business for quite a while now, and he left the goddesses in charge of day-to-day -day affairs in his absence, so this was probably his way of thanking them for all of their help. But while Hera was admiring the intricate beauty of the gift that she thought her adoring husband had sent her, vines burst out of the armrests and entangled her. Her arms were suddenly bound to the seat, and despite all of her godly strength, the enraged goddess couldn't break free. The queen of Olympus stumbling into a trap in front of her fellow gods was not a good look, but the other Olympians were so afraid of Hera that they wouldn't even consider making a joke out of the situation or throwing it in her face. Some of the gods even stepped up to try and help. Athena, her brother Ares, and Aphrodite tried to cut the vines, poison them, and sweet talk them, but they had no effect. Whoever had sent these thrones was a powerful magic user, an incredible craftsman, or both, to the point where the Olympians' abilities were useless against their work. The Olympians went back and forth for a long time about who could be the culprit. An arrogant king with a god complex? One of Zeus's many, many scorned lovers? But no one they mentioned fit all the criteria. Until Dionysus chimed in. The god of wine mentioned that when he and some friends were sailing through some loser king's land, his army ambushed their vessel and Dionysus had to jump ship to escape. He took shelter with some Nereids he knew, Thetis and Eurynome, and while he was there, he saw they had another visitor. He never saw the man's face, but the Nereid said his name was Hephaestus and that he rarely left his workshop nowadays. Realizing that the fates rarely dabble in coincidence, Dionysus paid Thetis and Eurynome a visit to ask them more about their mysterious housemate. And while they were initially kind of reluctant to explain how he came to live with them, they knew they had to fess up when Dionysus told them about the throne. It turns out there was a fatal flaw in Hera's plan to dispose of her unwanted son. When you throw something, or someone, off the most visible mountain in the land, there's a lot of potential for witnesses. Thetis told Dionysus that while she and your enemy were out one morning, they saw what they thought was a star falling from Olympus. She said it appeared to be falling really fast, but it wasn't until the evening that it finally crashed into the ocean surface. After a whole day's worth of hype building up, they couldn't just not investigate and see what the falling object was, but they never would have guessed they'd find a baby at the impact site. If they had, they might have minded their own business, but now it was too late. They had the crying baby in their hands and knew they had to choose their next move wisely. Because this baby had clearly done something horrible, right? There had to be a reason that he was discarded by the gods themselves. The last thing that Thetis and her enemy wanted was to make enemies out of their new rulers by rescuing their vanquished foe, or potentially bring destruction on the world by nursing him back to health. All that being said, this was just a baby. An ugly one, sure, but a baby nonetheless, and they couldn't just leave him in the ocean to die. So, fearing what would happen if the Olympians found out they saved him, they brought the baby to their underwater cave where he would be safe and hidden from the world. Since the Nereid's cave only contained rocks for young Hephaestus to play with, he discovered his loves of stonemasonry, metalworking, and all other forms of craftsmanship at a young age. And his access to rare materials in the Nereid's domain made it possible for him to produce inventions that others could only dream of including enchanted thrones. The Nereids didn't realize that the baby they saved was a god or that the throne he had spent the last few months building was for his birth mother. They didn't even know that Hephaestus knew that Hera was his birth mother. Every time they asked him about the events that preceded his fall, he always denied having any memory of them. But that clearly wasn't true. In reality, he must have been silently harboring a grudge against her for years while perfecting his craft and his plan for revenge. Hera thought that Hephaestus wasn't worthy of living somewhere as glorious as Olympus, but would she still find Olympus so great if she could never leave it? Dionysus thanked the Nereids for the information, then returned back to Olympus with his findings and theories about Hephaestus' motivation. He offered to visit the craftsman's workshop to try to talk some sense into him, but the Olympians blew him off, saying this task was better suited to their talents. 
Hephaestus' first visitor was Athena. She congratulated him on a revenge well executed and expressed her admiration for his patience and commitment to strategy. She told him that none of the Olympians could figure out how to reverse his trap and that if he agreed to go with her to Olympus and free his mother, then Zeus would surely reward him with new tools and his own workshop finer than anything even he could dream up. Hephaestus barely acknowledged the offer though. With a grunt, he simply replied, I have no mother and continued hammering away at his anvil. Next, Aphrodite <laughs> appeared at the workshop entrance. She told Hephaestus that if he helped his mother, she would give him his own personal tour of Olympus and her bedchambers. But the master craftsman could not be swayed. He told Aphrodite, I have no mother and continued his work at the anvil. When bribery and seduction proved to be ineffective, Ares tried intimidation. While stroking his spear like he wanted nothing more than to send it ripping through Hephaestus' torso, he said, Look, we're going to figure out how to free your mother eventually, so you may as well release her now before she sends me back here to cripple your other leg and worse. Hephaestus didn't even flinch. There was no reward that could make up for the anguish his abandonment caused him. No amount of pleasure that could make him forget his past, and no pain worse than what he'd already gone through. Without missing a beat on the anvil, he told the god of war the same thing he told the others. I have no mother. Suffice to say, when the trio returned to Olympus and delivered the news to Hera, she was not happy. She kicked and screamed and demanded that they bring the cripple to her courtyard by any means necessary. But before Ares could head out with his fearsome dogs, Phobos and Deimos, Dionysus chimed in again and said, before we spill blood, might I suggest spilling some wine? Much to Ares' disappointment, Hera allowed Dionysus to try it his way first. So the god of wine and merrymaking headed back down to the Nereid's cave, strolled into Hephaestus' forge where the fire was still raging, and said to the blacksmith, Look, I know what you're gonna say, so let me say this first. I really don't have a mother. She was murdered by your mother. This statement worked as intended. Hephaestus was so surprised by the revelation, he actually missed a beat with his hammer and ruined the project he'd been working on all day. With a mix of agitation and resignation, Hephaestus turned to Dionysus, who said, why don't we discuss this over a drink? As the wine started flowing, so did the feelings. Dionysus told Hephaestus all about his mother, Semele, how Hera had tricked her into blowing herself up while he was still in the womb, and that it was only through Zeus's divine intervention that he was saved. He explained that Hera was insecure after enduring years of her husband's adultery, and this insecurity is likely what led to her conceiving Hephaestus improperly, then abandoning him when he didn't come out perfect. He told the blacksmith, If you come back to Olympus with me, you probably will be given that workshop Athena was talking about. I bet you can even ask to marry Aphrodite, and Ares wouldn't be allowed to lay a finger on you. But don't free her because you've been bribed to. Free her because you can free yourself at the same time. No one knows the anger and resentment that burns in your heart more than I do. And while my own method for coping with those feelings is questionable to some people, you're clearly a stronger and smarter god than I am. Also, she's your mother. I won't deny that she hasn't been much of one so far, but we're immortal. She has plenty of time to make it up to you. It may have been the wine, the words, the rewards, or a combination of all three, but Hephaestus couldn't deny that his friend Dionysus had a point. He'd literally spent his entire life alone in a cave without ever stepping out to see the world all because the only thing he cared about was getting revenge. By allowing himself to forgive his mother, he could be free of the pain that her actions caused him. Not only that, but if Hera was the type to hold grudges, then he knew that the best way to get revenge was to not be like her, and that meant letting it go. Plus, he'd have a beautiful new wife and workshop for him to take his mind off any lingering pains. A little off balance from the bottles of wine that he and Dionysus had polished off, Hephaestus slowly rose to his feet and through slurred speech said, I'll go to Olympus. You just gotta get me there. And then he passed out. This was his first time drinking. What do you expect? Now Dionysus could have just snapped his fingers and transported them both to Olympus's courtyard in an instant, but there was no theater in that. So he took a different approach. Back on Olympus, Hera was still bound to her throne as furious as ever when she heard what sounded like music and cheering coming from the direction of Olympus's gates. Obviously, she couldn't investigate the sound, which made her all the more frustrated, but the noises slowly grew louder and louder, and then 
she saw them. Descending to the courtyard was a very small parade. Dionysus and two of his satyr friends were leading a donkey down the steps, and on that donkey was the cause of her suffering the bane of her existence. Only he was intoxicated and totally unconscious. Hera was about to chastise Dionysus for his methods, but the god pointed out that she told them to use any means necessary. Hephaestus didn't need to be bribed or threatened. What he needed was a friend, and nothing builds a friendship faster than getting absolutely hammered together. Then he added that Hephaestus had forgiven her for throwing him off the mountain, so she should forgive him for the whole trick chair situation. Hera wasn't willing to be so forgiving just yet, but she at least agreed to hold off on delivering a punishment until Zeus returned, to which the drunken Hephaestus replied, I'll wait to free you until Zeus gets back here then. A bold strategy, I know, but it turned out to be a smart one. When Zeus finally did return to Olympus and was caught up on all the drama he missed, he found it pretty hilarious, and he thought that Hephaestus should be rewarded for managing to outsmart all of the gods. So Hephaestus, cautiously and carefully, freed his mother from her bindings, expecting her to at least give him a smack for the trouble he caused. After all, she threw him off a mountain just for being ugly. Surely she'd try to get him back when Zeus wasn't looking. Surprisingly though, that didn't happen. Instead of a smack, he caught a glimpse of what appeared to be respect on her face. Reluctant respect, but respect nonetheless. And for a fleeting moment, he thought, maybe one day we can move beyond forgiveness and become friends. That wasn't going to be today though. He had a brand new forge to warm up and the view from Olympus had already given him a ton of new ideas for projects he could start with. Hephaestus would go on to make automatons that served the gods all the food, nectar, and ambrosia their hearts desired, weapons and armor for the Olympians and their chosen heroes, and even a chariot so Helios could travel across the sky faster and on a consistent schedule. The master craftsman's arrival on Olympus changed the lives of the gods and countless mortals for the better and more importantly, it gave him peace. That is the story of the fall, revenge, and rise of Hephaestus. It's a pretty wild story, eh? It might be my favorite out of all the Greek myths I've read over the years. Then again, I might just be emotionally attached to it at this point, considering that we've worked on this episode for four months now. Hephaestus is now my emotional support god which is probably better than Dionysus when you think about it. Once again, I want to thank the amazing artists whose talents brought this story to life in a way that my words alone never could. And I want to thank our sponsor Squarespace for giving us a bigger budget. For the two-ish people who don't know about Squarespace yet, they are the industry leaders in DIY website creation. They have an amazing selection of tools that gives creators of all kinds the ability to design beautiful websites, regardless of experience level. There is a massive library of beautiful award-winning templates to choose from based on what kind of website you're looking to launch. And after you've got that set up, you can add galleries of your artwork and playlists of your music to really make your site unique. You can even sell products on these sites you build with Squarespace, a feature we want to utilize on MessedUpOrigins.com someday. You can also embed videos, create VIP members only areas to sell access to, and one of my favorite things Squarespace does is give you access to analytics that show you how much traffic you have, where it's coming from, what people are doing while they're on your site, and that info goes a long way when you're growing your business. What may be the craziest feature of all though is that all of this design work can be done inside your web browser. You don't have to install any fancy software and you'll never have to worry about downloads and patches. So if you want to join the thousands in our community who've benefited from using Squarespace, go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to try them out completely free. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Whoa, you're still here? I figured you'd leave during the sponsor segment. I'm glad to see you, of course. That's just when the fake squad tends to dip out. Sucks, because I actually have some interesting sh** to say if they could just wait a minute. But nah, they gotta rush out for the next dopamine hit. I sound salty. It's all good. I actually like the idea of a more private conversation between us friends. Should I dim the lights and make it more intimate? No, I shouldn't, because we're just friends. That was a test, and you failed. I can't look at you the same way anymore. Maybe you should have gone during the sponsor segment. Okay, has this bit run its course? Well, thanks for sticking around, but I should really get going. I know, it looks bad. You stayed to the end for my benefit, and now I've gotta leave. 
Tell you what, to make it up to you, I'll skip all the cringy self-promo bullshit that everyone hates. I won't ask you to like and subscribe or to follow the Messed Up Origins podcast on your favorite podcast platform. You can just go. But if you wouldn't mind, I do got to implore you to do one thing. It's real simple. It'll only take a second. You just got to remember, John shot first. Thank you.